Peace, peace, and welcome. Thank you for uh, tuning in to another episode of uh, Cook on Quarantine. Um, this discussion is especially important for me. This, 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 this gentleman doesn't know that I've been uh, paying attention to his career ever, first, ever since I first came across his name when I was an undergrad at Williams College. Um, he represented a level of achievement and leadership that, uh, you know, deeply inspired me. I'm excited to launch into a discussion with him today to learn more about, you know, what his path has been like, types of things he's focused on now, and uh, how we all can be like Mr. Clarence Otis one day. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Otis, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Happy to join you. I have to start with Darden Restaurants uh-huh. and uh, in the Olive Garden. How, how many people were surprised that a, a black man was the CEO of the Olive Garden? I started that job as a CEO probably in 2004, I think it was. Uh-huh. And uh, I had been at Darden uh, since 95. And at one point, uh, I think starting in 97, maybe 98, I was CFO. So inside the restaurant world, I guess it wasn't as big a surprise. And inside Darden, your typical consumer doesn't really think about, you know, who owns Dar- or Olive Garden or who owns the brands. At that time, we had Red Lobster. and uh, Eventually, we acquired Longhorn Steakhouse and Capitol Grill. So they don't really think about those as businesses, really. They think of the brands. Uh, and so Darden itself wasn't that well known. Mm-hmm. And then I think it is a surprise when people find out it's owned by one large company and that uh, the CEO was African American. That does start to surprise folks. So at the company since 95 and then eventually became CEO. Um, but you started your life in Mississippi. Is that correct? I did. I was born in Mississippi, although um, my parents moved. We moved. They moved the family when I was pretty young. So I left at four years old. So really. Uh, I I grew up in Los Angeles. That's where okay. we moved to. Yeah, yeah. So those are my earliest memories would be L.A. Mm-hmm. And we had family that continued to be in Mississippi, and we would visit. In fact, my father and mother had very large families. My father's family would have a family reunion every every other year, so we'd go down there frequently. But most of my growing up was L.A. I want to say it was Watts, but I could be wrong. No, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, we lived in Watts that whole time. So South LA is what they call it now. Mm-hmm. They used to call it South Central. And Watts, South Central and South LA are really big. So South LA essentially starts just south of uh, downtown LA. Call mm-hmm. it Olympia, which is Olympic, which is like um, 10th Street and goes all the way to 116th Street. Mm-hmm. And so Watts is on the very southern edge of that essentially from 92nd Street to 116th Street. What, what are some broad stroke memories of growing up in South LA, South Central? Well, I grew up in Watts. Uh, it was, it was uh, a lot going on. So I was in Watts when the first Watts riot took place because it happened in 65, so I was nine years old. But that's still a memory. I remember buildings burning. I remember the National Guard with the teams and the bayonets and all of that. And then we, I grew up right down the street from the Watts Towers. So Watts Towers is one of the signature features of the community. And I grew up right down the street from that. So that's always a memory. After the riot, uh, a lot of artists would um, convene there. They started a Watts Towers Art Center. And I used to spend a lot of time at the Watts Towers Art Center. <laughs> oh, doing what? <laughs> Uh, they had everything. They had theater, they had visual arts. So my youngest sister and I did a lot of theater stuff there. Uh, the visual artists who ran the towers, you know, unbeknownst to us, <clears throat> were uh, very accomplished and now are legends. So a guy by the name of Noah Purfoy, uh, another guy by the name of John Outerbridge, who are uh, Mr. Purfoy is deceased, but John Outerbridge who's now elderly, but still world-renowned artists at this point. But mm-hmm. we didn't know that. They were just guys that ran, you know, ran the center. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, so you, you grew up there. What was some, like, you talked about that as a memory. What do you remember, like, uh, 
key lessons that your that your family or broader community wanted to instill? Was there like things that they often said, like this is? Yeah, well, I grew up. Uh, uh, it was a tough neighborhood, you know, still is. Demographics have changed a little bit. Back when I was there, it was probably eighty-five percent African American, fifteen percent uh, Latino, basically Mexican American, actually Chicano. So well-established Mexican Americans have been there long before uh, the neighborhood even turned black, and now it's probably sixty-five percent uh, Mexican American, thirty-five percent black. But Wax was a tough neighborhood, uh, a lot of um, crime and violence and youth gangs. So Watts is one of those, uh, L.A. is one of those cities that has had youth gangs for a long, long time, like Chicago and Philly. And I grew up sort of in the epicenter of all that. You know, I know and went to elementary school with the founders of the Crips. You know, Grape Street Crips is a famous gang there. I went to Grape Street Elementary School. Uh, and then I went to high school with a founder of the Bloods, and uh, in fact, we played football together. I was a mm-hmm. linebacker, he was the defensive back behind me. So it had all of that going on. Uh, but it also, after the riots, uh, benefited from, you know, Johnson's sort of great society programs. So a lot of youth programs, a lot of arts programs. So Watts was sort of the epicenter of the black arts movement. Mm -hmm. And so the black arts movement would be uh, visual artists like David Hammonds, John Outerbridge, Sonia Sanchez, the poet. So you had all of that coming in, as well as youth programs, after school programs, team posts, all of that. And you had the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. You know, the Panthers were big in California. In general, had started in the Bay Area in Oakland but had a huge presence in L.A. as well. So mm-hmm. all of their breakfast programs and after-school programs, it was a lot of Black nationalist messaging, mm-hmm. <laughs> politically, artistically. Mm-hmm. And so people were telling you how you were oppressed and why you were in the situation you were in and that you could get out of this and you could achieve. And that was reinforcing really what the, um, the teachers were saying our teachers back then, mostly uh, black teachers, very few white teachers, a uh, few Mexican teachers, Mexican principals. Uh, and so we were in a, in a moment where despite all of the tough things that were going on, you could get encouragement. You know, the, the kids who did well in school uh, got encouragement from the teachers, um, really tried to tried to set their sights pretty high. And that was consistent with what my parents were preaching as well. Uh, so so all of that was part of the, the growing up experience. Well, there's so, so, much, there's so much there to break out, you know, <laughs> the founders of the Bloods and the Crips, the, the benefit of the Black nationalist message, uh, uh-huh. it sounds like uh, you're, you're saying. And, um, and, you know, that you rose out of that and what I would say is like um, a, a spectacular level of achievement without the type of notoriety it should be associated with, you know, because like the, I mean, the, the the Bloods and the Crips are like, uh, it's probably like an international organization, right? Right. <laughs> right? And they started with people that you went to school with and you you ran a, a national company. Is is, is, is Darden international? Uh, Darden has, has operations outside the U.S. So Darden okay. operates owns and operates all of the restaurants in North America, uh, North America. Yes. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Canada and the U S mm-hmm. and then it franchises outside the U S so Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico, the middle East, so Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. uh, some other places in Latin America. Yeah. So it, it has an international footprint that way. And so that national, that black nationalist message and the benefits of it is actually something that I, I'm really interested in being on the school board. In San Francisco. Oh, okay. The emphasis on it sort of gets distracted, I would say, in this discussion about ethnic studies mm-hmm. and ethnic studies being like a multicultural emphasis in curriculum. Um, but the, the, the black nationalist sort of like principles 
um, or lessons around like knowledge itself, your true mm-hmm. history, your true capacity is like very specific to, you know, the history of Africa and not so much a, a multicultural approach. And so um, I'm planning to introduce some curriculum or, or let some legislation that, that mm. speaks to that. Um, yeah. do you, would you say it's something that, was it positive? Was that positive? Oh, absolutely. You? Yeah, yeah. So I, I just feel like uh, when you're in a, cal- in a place like Watts, community that's under-resourced, that has substandard housing, you know all this because at that time you could watch television and know it. Uh, you certainly know it today where, the, where people are much more connected. People have to have a understanding, okay, how did I get here? Why am I in this situation? Because if you don't have knowledge, it's easy to start to develop an inferiority complex. And so that whole movement basically said, let's talk about why we are where we are. Why are we here? And so I think that context setting, why is it that we're at the bottom of this uh, socioeconomic hierarchy and that it's about some very larger dynamics that have nothing to do with your self-worth is important. And I would say the same thing if you were talking about uh, African-American kids who are upper middle class. So why is it that I'm always facing these slights? You know, why is it that people are suggesting that I'm less than, not as smart as? And you need that context to avoid an inferiority complex to come out with a healthy sense of self-esteem and certainly the black arts movement, which included, as I said, the artists, the theater, but also literature and introducing you to the writers who sort of lay all this out. It's important to build a a strong platform of self-esteem in an environment where people are treated as less than, where people are oppressed. It's especially important. Yeah, the, the, the only reason I'm slightly surprised is because um the the media narrative about uh the negativity associated with like a a black nationalist approach does not at all jive well with like corporate america which you ascended to the top of you know Uh but i hear you say that i'm like okay we can really talk now i can really (laughs) i really (laughs) want to get into you with some stuff because like with the you know and obviously like i'm sure your work has allowed you to build with and uh, find common ground with people from all different walks of life. Uh, it was it's necessary when you're in leadership to learn people, embrace people. And I want to get some, some of your lessons on leadership also. When you look at the necessity of that for this neighborhood and some maybe some like pervert or perverted ways that people tried to find power through like these organizations that had these criminal elements, right? It's, I'm sure someone like you would see like the context and the nuance of it, you know. So I just I, I wanted to get your 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 thoughts on um, what, if anything, positive came from these organizations like the the Bloods and the Crips. Yeah, yeah. We gravitate to, and uh, you know, why do they still? Why is it still sustained to this day? Yeah, you know, the guys that I know that were founders, leaders in these organizations were people who had serious leadership skills and uh, were were academically quite capable, right? So these were were kids who could have easily been A students. Some of them were A students. I can talk about a couple of those examples. And so they had the leadership skills. They could develop followership. Um, people looked to them and it simply got channeled into this avenue versus the avenue where me and so the others got channeled and a lot of why it gets channeled one way or the other I think has to do with your home situation and your family structure that's part of it Uh, but part of it is just um, short term versus long term focus so the academic piece, it takes longer to sort of uh, reach some of the material goals and people are impatient. So even the guy who founded the, the Bloods, 
Herman Coleman is his name. Herman, uh, you know, his father, his brother, John, uh, was an A student too. Herman was as well. John wound up, he was a football player, but serious academic. He wound up going to Rice, uh, playing football there, graduating, successful commercial insurance uh, broker. You know, John wound up ultimately going to jail and out. Uh, so in the same family, you know, so some of it is not just your family situation. Sometimes it's family, but then even in the same family, sometimes it's just the patience level. Are you sort of willing to wait? Are you impatient? Uh, and the impatient sort of tend to head toward what I would call the, the sort of underground economy. Um, and that is where gangs start to show up because they do, in fact, control a lot of financial uh, transactions, uh, the drug trade, et cetera, et cetera. So those are, those are some of the things. Uh, but, but the leaders, Wayne Day, and Wayne was always at the top of that whole hierarchy. He was, really, he was not a street soldier, uh, but he has been in and out of jail for a lifetime, you know, so, and he was extremely smart. So you're going throughout high school, you know, your K through 12 experience. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, you're playing sports. It sounds like you're involved at the art center. Yeah. Um, and then you go to Massachusetts for some reason. Right. <laughs> so um, how did you first hear about Williams? Because of all of this, all these resources, and after Watts came Detroit and Newark in 67 and a lot of other places in 68. So the, the colleges, the the, the uh the mainstream majority white colleges started to really take an interest in getting black students. And so I was fortunate to come along when that started to take off. I would say the first significant classes of black students at schools like Williams and Columbia and Harvard uh, showed up probably in 69 or so. That's probably about right. I showed up at Williams in 73. And so we had started, and even in our high school, the kids at the top of the class, you know, the top, in our case, probably the top 100 kids expected to go, to go to college, some kind of college. It's 100. Our class was 700. But in reality, probably about 400 people came to school every day. Uh, so out of that group that came to school every day, a quarter of the folks expect to go to college. It was, it was definitely, whether it was one of these uh, elite uh, kind of selective colleges or it was Cal State LA. And so there was a, there was a college going culture inside the, inside the high school. My sister came before me. She went to Pomona out at the Claremont Colleges. And so there was an expectation. We had college counselors. Um, at my high school, we had four, and they were encouraging kids. And back in those days, you know, the cities were tough. So kids were looking to get out of the city and go to school someplace other than in L.A. And they were encouraging kids to really uh, get out of the region and think about either Northern California or the East Coast. So I heard about Williams in that context, just because there were actually uh, a couple of guys ahead of me, one three years ahead and one two years ahead. The guy three years ahead had gone to Williams already from my high school. The other guy had gone to, um, uh, to Amherst. I wasn't the pioneer. I was following. I was actually following folks who had already made that move. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, I went to I went to a high school uh, in the black neighborhood, considered like the black neighborhood in San Francisco, Baby Hunters Point. Uh, yeah, I went to Thurgood Marshall, and uh, my English teacher went to Williams. Uh huh. And so um, she was my so- she was my sophomore year English teacher. Oh, okay. And so uh, I wanted to get out. I was like, I am out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so my only goal was to get as far away as possible. And yeah. she was like, oh, put Williams on the list, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we definitely wanted to go east. Um, 
you know, because basically if you were Val Victorian or top three, you know, California, as you know, there aren't that many schools on that list of 50. You got Berkeley and UCLA, and then you got Stanford and the Claremont schools. And so uh, if you didn't want to go there, it was East. And so a lot of kids actually were going East. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Um, so you had heard about it. So it sounds like when you got there, somebody from your school was there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were, they were, uh, they were on Cheney. Um, did, you, did you visit before you go or did you just show up? I was not going to go. I was actually going to go to Stanford. I said, mm-hmm. well, that's a little far. I've never been east of Mississippi. Weather sounds, you know, I think I'm just going to do Stanford. Mm-hmm. And there was an alum who had interviewed me. Uh, and he really thought I should go to Williams. So he actually paid for me to go take a visit. Mm-hmm. So I did see it before, before I committed. And, and you still wanted to go after you visited. <laughs> yeah, and I said, well, okay, this, this could work pretty well. You know, yeah. it was smaller. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I knew what Pomona was like, which is where my sister was. And uh, so I knew that kind of school could work pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, having read just a bit about your academic experience, because you, you ended up going to Stanford Law, is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. right. So, so you must have done well at Williams. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. I struggled at Williams. I was like, I was like holding on to that C, like real. real. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I struggled to adjust, uh, you know, culturally um, uh-huh. to, the, to the campus. What was your experience like? I mean, Williams, when I got there, uh, there were probably 100 black students, 120, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, no Latino students, you know, uh, in any numbers. Probably in the whole school, there might have been four. <laughs> mm. It was So it's very different than when you were there. Um, the black students really uh, carved out their own community inside Williams. So this was a black nationalist time. So we were very, even though we're going to a white school, very separatist. So we go to class, but most of our friends were other black students. We didn't have a lot of friends who weren't black. And the BSU um, was a place that um, did all the social functions for black students did all of the extracurricular speakers uh, the BSU would bring in. And so it was sort of a a separate community within a community. So we had a modern dance troupe that was black, black repertory theater company that put on our own plays. Uh, We'd bring in speakers. You know, I remember going to Albany Airport to pick up Tony Morrison, uh, Stokely Carmichael. <laughs> oh, no, wait, wait, wait. You, I don't want you to brush over those people. <laughs> oh, no, so you picked Tony Morrison up from the airport. Yeah, so Tony Morrison was was at that time still, you know, this is going back a while, so mm-hmm. the early 70s, so she was still mid-70s, an editor at Random House. She had done the bluest eye and her new book uh, that was about to come out was Sula. And so she was not the Toni Morrison that had become an international star at that time. Mm. And so I went to the airport, uh, picked her up, you know, mm. brought her to campus for some lectures that she was doing. Well, Stokely Carmichael was much better known mm. uh, by then because uh, he'd been SNCC and all of that had been going on for more than 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he had changed his name by then. I forget his African name. Yeah, Kwame Ture. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Changed his name by then. Um, and he was coming to do a speech. We had a good conversation. He talked about how he grew up in New York. He went to one of those specialized schools. I forget whether it was Bronx Science or Stuyvesant or, or, um, it was one of those two. He talked about how coming out of school, high school in 1960, he was going to go to Williams. But he visited Howard and Sterling Brown, 
who had went to Williams, you know, early in the 20th century, English professor at Howard convinced him to come to Howard and start going to Williams. Mm. <laughs> uh, and that's the kind of student they were recruiting at that time, really were kids who, who essentially came from predominantly black backgrounds. Mm. So whether they grew up in Watts or Harlem, and a lot of them didn't, they were upper middle class. They tended to go to um, public high schools with the upper middle class background. Uh, my background coming out of a public high school inner city was rarer. The kids that came out of the inner city tended to come out of magnet schools or ABC program. Right. So they'd gone to the, you know, the boarding schools. Did you, did you have like, a, you know, I know with the, building out your own culture and the emphasis on like being separatist. There is like a strong community there. Were you there? Did you have a chip on your shoulder while you were there? No, no. I mean, I really, um, I enjoyed it. I felt academically, you know, because I'd grown up in an environment that was black nationalist and where, because I was always a, a stellar student, I was always propped up, and you know, viewed as as strong intellectually, valedictorian. You know, I mean, I, I I didn't get any B's in high school or junior high school, so I felt confident academically. Um, and so, even though the first semester was a struggle, I felt like you know, these kids have had a head start, but I can catch up and do this. Mm-hmm. So I never felt. Uh, behind Um, and I realized that a lot of the kids who came there were not as well prepared they they went to better schools Um, they were not as as well supported as we had been so they had a lot more self-doubt they weren't really schooled in black history and sociology and so they tended to struggle more you know my mm. brother-in-law my sister came the year after me mm. and we went to the worst high school in la mm. so <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was shocking um, right. you know, yeah. that you weren't that far behind is basically uh-huh. the message that was coming through well i mean your your, your life is so um i mean you, you you've done so many things i don't want to stick too long on college um I'm so interested in in hearing about the journey going from like starting at uh, Darden and then becoming CEO. I really I want to also want to get into some some of the discussions just for like like what's going on in the country right now. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about black economic independence. Um, I'm, I'm I'm curious to know all the other elite black people you know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like he must know Barack. He must like that. <laughs> they must text each other. <laughs> like you must know uh, Deval Patrick and Rob Johnson. They must all be your friends. Uh-huh. You know, like I'm like he must be like you can debunk any of this if you feel like it. He must be on a short list to be an ambassador somewhere. You know, I have like <laughs> all of these like um, uh, assumptions about you. But when you when you started at the at the company, were you like I want to be CEO one day? Is that what, did you go in thinking that? Uh, no, I didn't. I really didn't. I, uh, you know, I went, uh, I knew I wanted to be in the private sector, in the commercial world. You know, my sense was that if you could control uh, or have serious influence into a big operation, global operation, you could actually advance uh, the African-American gender from an employment perspective, how companies operate. So that was always, I felt important, and which is where I geared myself. I didn't know much about the business world. And so it was a learning journey. You know, I went to law school because I didn't know what I wanted to do and then uh, wound up doing corporate law because that was the legal entry into the commercial world versus criminal law or some of the other stuff. And uh, once I got there, I realized I could have a bigger impact being in the mix as a business person as opposed to a lawyer. So I 
transition from law to Wall Street to finance. And it's true. I mean, you can, you can. So I always felt like I wanted to um, be one of the senior leaders that established the direction of the company, shaped the company, how it operates, its culture. And so I moved into management on Wall Street and then um, was recruited to be treasurer at Darden. Darden was, had been for its almost all of its history part of General Mills, but General Mills was separating it out as an independent public company, so they needed a treasurer, and I got recruited for that. And I would say my objective at that point, given my background, was to be CFO, Chief Financial Officer. Um, that was the goal. And so that's what I was shooting toward, ultimately became CFO. And um, my career trajectory was focused on that. So I would have expected to move from Darden, be CFO at a bigger company with a bigger platform. Mm. Uh, but my the, the CEO of Darden told me that he thought I could move past finance and uh, gave me a shot at stepping into the business and being an operator, running one of the businesses, he thought I could be CEO. So he, he's the one that saw that. You know, my path was Darden, which was Fortune 400 to maybe a Fortune 200 CFO to a Fortune 50. But uh, Joe Lee uh, really thought I ought to think about the CEO opportunity, the possibility, mm. which was important because he controlled. He didn't have complete control of it, but he has significant influence, obviously, uh, with the board to mm-hmm. decide who will be the next CEO. Mm-hmm. I love what you just said uh, a while ago about advancing the black agenda through corporate America. What does that look like? Yeah, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's important. So um, it's important to have black entrepreneurs, black businesses, but entrepreneurs employ, they deploy resources, uh, but most entrepreneurs don't get to global scale. Some do, a few, uh, but most don't. I mean, among African-American entrepreneurs or black entrepreneurs, there are a couple that have gotten to global scale and they really are able to advance the black agenda. So Robert Smith at Vista uh, has done that. There's another guy, Bio Ogan Lazy. He runs something called Global Infrastructure Partners. And they are probably control $80 billion worth of uh, assets and companies. They own uh, one of the airports in, in London. Uh, and Bio advances the black agenda. But, but those are rare. I mean, if you get 10 of them, that's huge, right? And so. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that the other way to do it is to us to get to leadership in these established companies and help make decisions about how they employ and how those resources are deployed. And so that's important to be in that CEO role or CFO. And uh, so that's that's how I think about that. Yeah, my my perception of it as someone that's, that doesn't have to navigate it and that's not in it is that uh, people get into the position and they always feel uh, gun shy about talking pro black or hiring black like that because they don't want to rub people the wrong way. So they kind of get there and they're like, "Well, I'm here, so we we got it," you know. But no, like, I, don't, you know. I don't think that that that's what happens. What tends to happen if you're a CEO. Um, the way you make the case is to say, look, you know, we want the best team in the, in the, you know, on the planet. Uh, and so we want really to uh, recruit broadly and have a diverse employee base. And um, we also want to understand all the potential customers out there. So we want to engage with 
every segment of the community. And so that's the way you put it. Uh, and so part of that is, well, we got we got to hire black people, and we got to engage with and meet the demands of black people, and serve the demands of black people. We got to be engaged in the black community because we have to be engaged in all these communities. And so if you do it that way, it's part of the overall corporate agenda. It's not some program on the side. And right. you build a culture around uh, being that kind, of, that kind of breath in your outreach and that kind of inclusivity. And so mm -hmm. when you look at certain organizations, they stand out because they've had those kinds of leaders. So American Express, um, you know, they have more black senior leaders. They have more black employees. They do more in the black community than most financial companies because Chenault was there for 20 years, Ken Chenault. And so it, you can make a difference. Uh, same thing at Darden. You know, the guy who runs Olive Garden, which is more than half the company's revenues, is Mexican-American, Chicano from San Diego. Um, so you can, you can definitely, the, the, the imprint lasts. How were you successful at doing that? What, 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 did the, the, what did the change look like in terms of percentages that the company employed? It was already a pretty diverse company. Okay. You know, that was what made it comfortable for me to be there. That's how I got to the job in the first place. You know, so my uh, successor, our predecessor, as I mentioned, Joe Lee, Joe had been with Darden from early days. He was a general manager of First Red Lobster. Bill Darden, who the company's named after, he worked for Bill Darden. They were both Southerners, South Georgia, but they uh, ran integrated restaurants during Jim Crow times because that's how they decided they wanted to run their operation. They had an integrated workforce. Um, Walt was the head of culinary there. When I got there, he'd been with Bill and Joe for a couple of decades. And so it was already... It was already important to them, which is why I was there. And our sort of operations, if you look out in the restaurants, already had strong representation. Um, I would say uh, at Red Lobster, probably, I, don't know, I can't recall the exact percentage, but the percentage of the managers who are African-American, not just people of color, but African-American, was over 15 percent and so it was already there we uh put in place when i got there we just added more structure to it and so we uh had a lot of leadership development programs and we decided we would not ask people to say well who has high potential when it came to people of color we would assess, we put all the people of color in the assessment program to try to figure out what their what their leadership potential was, what gaps they had, what development they needed. Um, and we had a very we had a very diverse group. So at the very top, um, Jim Council was African American. Um, at that, that time uh, the head of operations for Red Lobster was African American. The head of Olive Garden, the guy who's now the president, was uh, the head of operations there. He was Mexican American. The woman who ran Longhorn was Mexican American. Head of HR was uh, Asian American. CIO, chief information officer, was Asian American. So, you know, a very diverse group at the top. And so people knew that it, we meant it. And we put, in, put structures in place that really made sure that folks of color didn't get overlooked. And so the numbers were pretty high down into where most of the people were, which is in the restaurants, mm -hmm. in the general manager ranks, because every restaurant has a general manager and then three assistant managers. Yeah, and, and you did all that while building a Fortune 500 company, or by being a Fortune 500 company. Yeah, we were already a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. Uh, when I got there, we were probably, our revenues may have been about $3.5 billion. And when I left, they were probably 
eight. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. Mm-hmm. So we we grew double revenues mm-hmm. in uh, in ten years. And part of that was we acquired companies. So we acquired um, Longhorn Steakhouse and Capital Grill, Yard House, which is uh, California based brand. We bought that Eddie V's. Yeah. Um, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the e- economic agenda or economic independence for, uh, the, the, for black America, mm-hmm. access to capital, um, you know, tomorrow is independence day. Uh-huh. Uh, I have an article coming out about what independence for black people would actually look like, right? And uh, and the economic aspect is a part of that. Um, I mean, what what would it look like for you? Would you say uh, what? How would you respond to that? Yeah, I think economic independence for black folks is uh, it starts with employment, and so black people, um, more black people being employed than are employed across the board. Uh, Black people being employed, the ones who are employed, being employed in better jobs than they have now. Um, And what I I mean by better is um, they're higher in the hierarchy. And so there's no, I think black people should be in retail, for example. There are great opportunities at a Walmart or Darden, but you need to be managing parts of Walmart need to be managing the Olive Garden as opposed to being a server or cashier. And so we need those ranks to grow. So if you've got a Walmart super center, I'm guessing a prototypical Walmart super center probably does $100 million million in sales, one unit. Mm. Um, The manager of that unit and I know this, especially because a family friend has a daughter who works for them, makes $200,000. So you definitely want to work at Walmart, but you want to be her, or you want to be one of the people that manages the various departments. She's got someone managing supermarket fees. She's got someone, you know, and they are all making six figures. If you're a general manager at an Olive Garden, you're making six figures. If you're a general manager, at a capital grill, you're making double that. So in those places where we are employed, we need to be up the totem pole into the better positions. And a lot of those we can do without the fundamental social reform that take a long time. So of course our schools have to be better. But the fact of the matter is in retail, in those jobs, in those general manager ranks, more than a half of those folks don't have a college degree. And so you don't have to wait to pick the school system. Uh, they're taught by the employers and they rise and they're just taught in the, in the organization. And then we need to be in uh, the places that we're not. So we need to be in the tech companies. Uh, we're not there. We need to be there. And again, we don't have to wait for the long-term solutions, filling the pipeline with engineers. You know, Facebook and Google, um, a huge percentage of those workforces are not engineers. You know, they're in HR, they're in finance, they're in marketing. And so they just need to hire us because we have plenty of people in HR and finance and marketing. Uh, And so that whole pipeline thing, this notion of waiting a generation, to me, doesn't make any sense at all. And then the other thing I would say is that we need to um, we need to have stronger black businesses. And so we've got a lot of proprietorships. And we have to take the best of those proprietors and provide them with uh, the technical skills and the capital to grow their businesses. Most proprietorships are going to state proprietorships, but there are people out there running um, barbershops and view salons and uh, especially retailers that should be bigger and they don't get the attention to get bigger. They don't get the technical know-how. They don't get the capital. So that would 
be a part of sort of black communities financial independence is for some of those proprietorships to begin to be uh, small businesses or medium-sized businesses and get bigger uh, and employ more people and generate greater wealth. And then the other part is um, is in the leadership ranks of the companies. So beyond employment, we need to run the companies and, direct, and set direction and uh, make resource deployment uh, decisions. You said you said so much good stuff. So I, I I ran a nonprofit for five years called Mission Bid, and the purpose mm-hmm. of that was to uh, give access to computer science to high school students that didn't have it. Mm-hmm. That's that whole pipeline issue. And because I'm in San Francisco, the whole discussion about diversifying tech, you know, right. I'm bombarded with it. I know it's sort of a national right. thing, and access to computer science is a national thing. Year after year, we see that diversity number is not really changing. Um, and a lot of the black people represented at the companies are, they, they are where you mentioned, like mm-hmm. HR, mm-hmm. some in marketing, maybe some in working security at the front desk. For me, like, you know, you talked about like patience versus non-patience. Like I'm, I'm sort of getting impatient about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I would uh, say the pipeline has to be addressed and that's the patience piece. Mm-hmm. But the folks who are in these other functions need to be promoted. And they need to get to senior levels. I wasn't a restaurant operator. You know, but yet I could ultimately become CEO. And so you can move from finance to the CEO slot. You can move from HR to the CEO slot. Um, Ken Frazier, who I know well, Ken's a CEO of Merck. Ken is not a scientist. He's not a doctor, but he's the CEO of Merck. He's a lawyer. He was the general counsel of Merck and became CEO. So they need to work these other positions. I think. I think it's a cop out when they start to talk about because Sheryl Sandberg is number two at Facebook and she is not an engineer. She's probably a political science major. Yeah, I'm, I wasn't a software engineer and I taught coding to kids all over the Bay. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, so I, I get that. And people would always say like, well, how do you teach coding and you don't code? And, I, <laughs> and then my flippant response was like, well, is the CEO of your car company a mechanic? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, if you can read and write, you can you can learn how to code without being an engineer. As mm-hmm. long as you can read and compute, and you have good computational skills. I mean, I was CFO without an MBA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I was always good at math. Uh, I mean, you don't need an MBA. Well, uh, there's this whole wave now about uh, pushing companies to get more black people in C-suite positions, to get more black mm-hmm. people on boards. I was looking at the board of Verizon. It is diverse. Yeah. It's like, it's a diverse board. Um, is that the only public board you serve on or do you serve on others? No, I serve on, uh, I serve on, um, on others. So I serve on the board of travelers, the insurance company Oh. and a company called VF that makes um, North face van oh. Timberland. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Verizon's a, a good example. I mean, Verizon is a heavily technical company, right? The network is the core of the company. But Verizon is 18% African American. Now people call it 18% African American employee base. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to you don't have to flood Verizon with engineers to move that number. Right. Yeah. Right. The woman who um, was number two basically at Verizon Consumer, and the consumer business is about 75% of Verizon, mm-hmm. is African-American. And she started at a call center. So I mean, right. you just got to give people a chance and, and then pay some attention to developing yeah. the skills as opposed to we get handicapped because when we show up, people say, well, these are the credentials you need. But those credentials weren't, weren't predicates before we showed up. Mm-hmm. Other people have come in and made their mark without those credentials. Verizon is a company that doesn't really focus on credentials. And that's why it's been able to get to the diversity numbers that it's gotten to. I, I wanted to sort of close out talking about uh, about family and uh, and how you are making yourself available to around like guidance and support for uh, professionals. So yeah. like, 
So you, you have children, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. How many children do you have? I've got three. What about your family? <laughs> so I've got uh, my wife and I've been married for 37 years. We have three kids. So my oldest uh, is 31. He just got out of Columbia's business school. And uh, he went to Columbia as an undergrad. And we have twins, a girl and a boy. My daughter works at Bloomingdale's. She runs their, um, their private label men's business. And uh, her brother, my other son, is a comedian. Mm. He writes for Trevor Noah, uh, mm. The Daily Show, and does stand up himself. Ad- advising support, like, what does that sort of look like? Does it just kind of happen randomly? Do you do it in a structured way for people that? Uh, both. And so we, uh, there's a group of, of, uh, of folks who've had long careers in the corporate sector, and we, advise folks that come to us either through referrals from people that we know or who are friends of our kids. A lot of those are about career and how you develop yourself, how you position the company. A lot of them are folks who are involved in starting your own thing. And so whether that's companies, um, operating companies or investment companies that invest in other and so we i'm involved with sort of talking to that full range and again some of those folks are are folks who either went to school with my kids or come to me as referrals from other people that i know okay okay i have i have like three more rapid fire questions okay let you enjoy your friday and uh (laughs) whatever else you had going um first one what is your worst moment what was your worst moment in business Oh, 9-11. Yeah, 9-11. Okay. So just having to try to figure out what do we do? We have people flying all over the place as a national, you know, sort of retailer. And so we had people stranded, basically, mm-hmm. in different places across the country. Uh, we had a lot of um, Arab American employees. And so trying to respond to everything that they were about to endure. Okay. Um, what personal weakness can you forgive in someone? Oh, boy. I would say, uh, you know, a lack of knowledge. You know, I mean, it's, it's people feel like they need to know everything and it's like that's impossible. And so I'm not one that feels like you need to know it all. All you got to do is is bring some a, a learning sort of spirit, a desire to know, as opposed to having all these facts in your head, and, you know, that's never any good, but just curiosity, intellectual curiosity uh, will make up for a lack of, of knowledge. Last and final question. Who's going to win the presidential election? <laughs> uh, I think Biden is going to win. <laughs> okay. I'd be my guess, but uh, uh-huh. I've been surprised before. Okay. <laughs> Um, I could talk to Mr. Otis another hour. Selfishly, I really want to, but uh, he was generous enough to give me his time today. I learned a lot. Hope everybody else does too. Thank you, uh, Clarence Otis. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Peace, peace, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Cook on Monday Morning. At Cook on Monday Morning, we believe that if you own Monday Morning, you can own the week. If you own the week, you can own the year. And if you change your year, you can change your life. As you all have probably noticed or heard me say already, uh, since the quarantine has started, I've changed up the way that we record and I call it the series Cook on Quarantine. Uh, So I'd like to thank Mr. Clarence Otis for joining me for another episode of Cook on Quarantine. Everything that exists around the show is still under the title Cook on Monday Morning. So Please be sure to subscribe on YouTube, hit the like, hit the share, hit the subscribe button. It really helps us expand this important knowledge that we're trying to get out to who it should get out to. Uh, So you can find us on Apple Podcasts. uh, You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on YouTube. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Cook on Monday Morning. Please subscribe. Please share it. Uh, we, we've been building a very small but very uh, committed group of people that really enjoy 
the content that we've been creating. And I deeply appreciate you for listening. Thank you. Uh, the biggest thing we can do to help support and build the podcast is just share it with a friend. You know, this the people that we've sort of engaged over the last six or seven months. Those are our early adopters. And uh, if you believe in what we're doing here, uh, you know, sharing it with a friend really helps. As you all have also heard me say, uh, the Cook on Monday Morning brand is a product of Luther Harris Holding Company. Uh, that's the company where I do all of my strategic advising and consulting work. Uh, Luther Harris was my great grandfather. That's his dictionary behind me. And everything that we are building here is based on this idea of ownership and, and legacy. So the stories that we tell, the content that we're making, the, the mindset that we're trying to elevate around ownership and um, legacy was all inspired by my great grandfather, Luther Harris. And so um, that's the reason why we do this. If you're interested in talking to me more about uh, how I can help your company meet its strategic uh, objectives your, or your, your nonprofit, I'd be happy to take a meeting with you. I'd be, I look forward to learning more about the work you're trying to do and the growth you're trying to um, execute on. You can reach out to me at info at Steve on Cook. You can also reach out to me on social media. I'm on LinkedIn at Steve on Cook on Twitter at Steve on Cook, on Instagram at Steve on Cook. You can also subscribe to my newsletter. It's at steveoncook.com. Uh, you should especially subscribe to my newsletter if you're looking to support the podcast and you want to be the first to get your hands on the merchandise that's coming out. We have a series of pieces that we're going to be releasing to the public uh, just as a way to uh, for people to showcase their support. We've never asked for Patreon or donations or, you know, any sort of financial support. We don't have any sponsorships for the podcast. This is all based on the support of the people that believe in this message that we're trying to promote. So uh, if you are interested in checking out our merchandise, it's going to be really dope. I'm really excited about it. Just, you know, subscribe uh, to my newsletter info at steve on cook but i'm sure i'll be putting it on social media too but if you want to see it first you subscribe to the newsletter again i want to thank mr clarence otis for taking the time to you know share his story with us i was really inspired i've always been inspired uh, when i first heard about clarence otis being the ceo of darden restaurants uh, just to know that you know at the highest levels of american business uh, there are black men and women leading without compromising a vision for advancing the black community. I think he really dispelled a lot of myths about this idea that, you know, you had to assimilate and not be unapologetic and wanting to promote improvements in the black community while ascending to the top levels of American business. So I think he represents that story. He's obviously committed to that work and he was able to share that so eloquently with me today. Um, so I appreciate him. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate our listeners. I've been doing uh, something, you know, that I, that I think is kind of special. I don't know. Y'all can tell me otherwise if you don't think so. But uh, I am trying to uh, do something nice for us, all of our single mothers, our mothers that are working hard, taking care of their families, doing it on their own. It's not work that you get celebrated for. It's obviously um, really challenging. And I just want to tell you that I appreciate your sacrifice um, and I want to do something nice for any single mothers that uh, listen to the podcast or if you know one that you think is deserving of a night out. Uh, I'm just treating uh, single mothers to dinner and it's, you know, obviously a pandemic. So, you know, if we can figure out a way for me to cover like child care for an evening and they can go out with them and a friend, um, it's a small gesture. It's obviously not a big, luxurious night. You know, I'm not in a position to do that yet, but hopefully if people like this idea and the, the podcast continues to to grow, uh, we can do more of this. So just send me an email, info at steveoncook.com. If you know of a person that you think uh, should get a night out, 
I'd be happy to cover a night out for them. I can do it at, you know, the kind of capacity of like twice a month, you know? So, <laughs> so if we get a backlog of really deserving people, hopefully over the course of time, we can just treat, treat folks to something nice. And so that's something that uh, I'm really excited about doing. Just email me info at Stephon Cook, write a few sentences about the person. Um, who you think is deserving and a way for me to contact them and then you know then i'll uh then i'll reach out and we can we can make that happen this podcast uh is really a testament of the people of san francisco that i truly love and appreciate it's for the people that keep our city running the people that do it without applause without ceremony they're relentless in their commitment they are unwavering in their capacity to give on themselves to improve our city. And so this podcast is for you. It's for our firefighters, our EMT workers, our teachers, our school lunch workers, our custodians, our social workers, um, all the people that are in blue collar jobs, our bus drivers, obviously like my father, our police officers, everyone that's keeping our city moving, everyone that's keeping our city safe. You know, everyone that's working in the in the in the blue collar profession. This podcast is for our employers, our people that are building and creating jobs in our city. This podcast is for you. And it's especially for our gig workers, the folks that are delivering food, uh, driving and ride shares, um, doing all of the sort of basic things as essential workers grinding trying to make ends meet in a city that is way way too unaffordable this podcast is for you i especially want all of you to have a mindset of ownership to be you know proud of the example that you're setting to know that your work is a part of a legacy and um if you do that work with integrity and honor you will be rewarded so i appreciate you for the work that you do. I appreciate you for supporting this podcast. Again, please like, please share, please like, please subscribe, <laughs> please share uh, the work that we're doing here. And um, until we meet again, peace, peace, and we out. <laughs>